Um, once we get into liquids, at some point liquids do, they're going to evaporate, okay? So we know that liquids can evaporate. You know, you leave a, a glass of water sit on your nightstand, you come back a week later, the glass is either empty or the glass is half as full as it was. You may see a little crud at the bottom of the glass, that kind of stuff. Or if you leave something sit outside, or uh, maybe you leave a pet bowl outside in the summer and you have to fill it up every day because uh, it evaporates in the sun, whatever it happens to be. But liquids evaporate, okay? It doesn't mean they're boiling, they just evaporate. So when that happens, we call that process vaporization, okay? And what's going on there is your higher energy particles, okay, your higher energy liquid particles, they escape into a gaseous state, okay? Remember, if we go back, all the way back to our Maxwell distribution curves here, we know that any one temperature, so if we're at, let's say, 300 Kelvin, okay, uh, which would be a really hot day, which is not the way it is outside today. Um, we know we have some particles that are very cold. We have some particles that are very, very hot. So you can imagine that at any given temperature, there's always some particles, enough of them way out here that they can maybe escape. They have the enough energy to escape those intermolecular forces. So when you have enough energy to escape, that's called evaporation, or that's called vaporization. Okay? So you're still going to have an average kinetic energy below the boiling point, okay? So keep that in mind. We're talking below boiling here, okay? But you still can evaporate some of those particles. Now, to increase that rate, okay, you just need to increase your average kinetic energy. Okay? So if you warm something up, it evaporates faster. Um, that's very simple. It's very, that's a very simple process, okay? Um, kind of a, something that you may not think about, but if you are ever to hand wash dishes, um, if you hand wash dishes, you really should uh, rinse them with really, really, really hot water, okay? The reason being, there's lots of little reasons, but one of the reasons being is that if you have really hot water and you set them on a, cool, on a rack to dry, they will actually dry faster with hot water because you have hot water, which means they have more energy, so more particles will evaporate faster, okay? A uh, little trick there for you. Um, anyway, as you increase temperature, you're going to increase that kinetic energy, so then more particles on average can evaporate, okay? Now, we talk about evaporation being a cooling process, and that kind of comes down to this idea of maybe sweating, okay? So let's talk about sweating for a little bit here. So if you are going to sweat, okay, imagine what is going on in your body, all right? So as you work hard, your body starts to get too hot, okay? So you, they want to find a mechanism to cool your body. Now, different animals do it different ways. The way that humans do it is we sweat, okay? So we don't pick which liquids leave our body, but what happens is we basically excrete liquid, Okay, out of our body. It's a mixture of water and some minerals, salts, that kind of stuff and everything. So we basically are sweating out water. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter if it's high energy or low energy, whatever it is. We just sweat out the water of our system. Okay? Once it leaves our body, it's now sitting on our skin. Okay? So that's how we get sweaty, is we have you know, moisture and wet stuff on our skin. Okay? So as soon as that water is exposed to the environment around us, Okay, even though it may be hot outside um, or cold outside, it doesn't really matter, that water begins to evaporate. Okay, so if you imagine as you are doing this, you're putting liquid on the outside of your body. Okay, your inside of your body isn't deciding what liquid goes out there, it's just all liquid goes out, okay, in terms of water. Once it gets out there, now the highest energy particles escape first. Okay, so the highest energy particles evaporate first. So if your highest energy particles evaporate first, which means the average energy of the remaining liquid outside your body is lower. Well, if you're lowering your average energy, that's colder than it was before. Okay? Kind of see that process? Um, so the way I kind of attribute this is, imagine that, say, <clears throat> you are on a relay team for track or for swimming or whatever it happens to be. If your fastest runner gets injured and can't run the race, okay, so they're taken out. Your fastest guy, your whatever gal it is, um, is, is gone, okay? What that means is your overall team now is going to be slower, right? Because whoever you replace it with won't be as fast as the person before because your fastest guy is out, okay? So if you go from your fastest guy being gone, now what happens is your overall team is slower, okay? And if you're slower, you have less energy, right? So that's like being colder. So that's how evaporation or that's how sweating works, is we sweat out liquid. Once it gets outside of our bodies, then the highest energy particles evaporate first. As a result, the net energy of that liquid goes down, which is a cooling process. And it starts to cool off our skin. 
Now, if we continue to generate heat, we'll just, we'll just keep excreting more and more liquid until we've properly cooled our bodies or until we stop working out or until we get dehydrated and then heat exhaustion and we die. So that's basically the end of sweating is either you stop working out, you properly hydrate, or you end up killing yourself. All right. Uh, kind of morbid, I know. Now, keep in mind that only those particles with the highest energies escape into molecular forces to liquid. So when we take a look at this kind of graphic over here. If you leave a container open and you let it sit here, the highest energy particles will eventually leave. They, they come flying. They can hit this barrier between liquid and, and gas. And if there's nothing holding them in, they have enough energy, they'll fly out. Okay? That's called evaporation. Okay? Your lower energy ones stay as liquid. The medium energy ones get to the surface and get pulled back in. But only your highest energy ones can evaporate. Okay? So that's how evaporation works. Now, the next step here is what happens when we close the system. All right, so evaporation under equilibrium conditions now, okay? So on an open system, you leave it open, like a container, your glass sitting on a counter, there's no equilibrium. So this will just continually evaporate slowly over time, um, and eventually all your liquid will, will evaporate, okay? Um, if you keep the temperature the same. Now, that's not no equilibrium. If you close the system, we call it a dynamic equilibrium, okay? The word dynamic means constant turnover. Okay, so what happens here is if you close the system, you will get particles to evaporate, and they'll keep evaporating just fine. But what will happen is that at some point, your particles get too many above the liquid here. And if there's too many above the liquid, they'll start to recondense. So some of these particles will bounce around, and they'll lose some of their energy, and then they'll hit the water, and they'll actually condense back in. Okay. Once you get this balancing act of particles evaporating and then condensing, evaporating, condensing, evaporating, condensing, or you get a, a balance between those two things, we call that an equilibrium. It doesn't mean that there isn't still change over particles. It just means that for every one that leaves, one comes in. One leaves, one comes in. One leaves, one comes in. It's very much like a busy restaurant, okay? You go to a busy restaurant and they say, they put your name on the waiting list, okay? So in that case, when the restaurant is full, you know, as soon as a group of people leave a table, they clean it up and a group of people comes in. So one in, one out, one in, one out, one in, one out. And um, when that happens, you basically have an equilibrium established at a restaurant. Now, restaurants like to be at equilibrium because that means that they're constantly full and they're constantly making their money, okay? So keep in mind that when we talk about dynamic, it's that the individual particles change, but there's no net change in the system, okay? So when you open the system, constant evaporation, there's no equilibrium. If you close it, okay, if you put a lid on your, your bowl or your dish or whatever you have, you put a lid on the milk, you put a lid on the orange juice, a lid on the... Uh, the gasoline in your garage, the um, you know paint thinner in your garage, they won't evaporate out, gone forever. Now, however, if you leave the lid off of a gas can in your garage and let it sit there for days, you're basically evaporating gas away from that gas can, and eventually it'll be all gone. Okay, it literally will go away. Um, so that's why we cap things or that and put lids on things is so the evaporation process can't run constantly. That it has to establish some sort of equilibrium. Now, above this liquid. Because we have evaporated some of this liquid and we now have the same particles in a gaseous state, that generates a pressure, okay? And we know that as you evaporate, that you generate pressure because you have more particles with more collisions. So when you get this extra pressure above there, we call that pressure vapor pressure. So it's that pressure created when you evaporate a gas above a liquid, okay? So... Once you start to do that, liquids actually generate this extra pressure, okay? It is dependent on temperature in the substance because the warmer it is, right, the warmer it is, the more evaporation we get. As you increase evaporation, as the energy goes up. So as you warm things up, you get more evaporation. If you are more volatile, term that we used before, if you're a more volatile substance, you'll evaporate more also. So if you have weaker intermolecular forces, you can also evaporate things more also, okay? The, both of those things will increase vapor pressure, okay? So as temperature goes up, so does vapor pressure. If you have a more volatile substance, you will have a higher vapor pressure also, okay? We always have this balancing act between liquid and vapor, liquid and vapor, liquid and vapor, um, evaporating, condensing, evaporating, condensing, evaporating, condensing, okay? So if you can imagine you always have some sort of vapor pressure, but you also have an atmospheric pressure pushing down on you if you have your container open. If your container is closed, initially you get all evaporation. 
at some point you get some evaporation, some con condensation, some evaporation, some condensation between those two things. Okay, so um, what happens is at some point you actually can establish that equilibrium. That equilibrium, if we go back to here, generates a certain amount of pressure. That pressure we call vapor pressure. Okay, so pressure that's generated by the liquid. All okay? right, now here's the thing once you've actually generated that pressure and you have a pressure above a liquid, if you were to open this up to the outside world, that would disturb that equilibrium, right? Okay, so if we have an open system, okay, if we have an open system, if we generate enough vapor pressure from the liquid and it actually starts to combat the atmospheric pressure pushing down against it, okay? So imagine in a closed system, it's all just about what's going on inside. But in an open system, you actually have pressure coming from the vapor and then you have atmospheric pressure pushing in the opposite direction. So in an open system, if you get most of the particles, if you get most of the particles to have enough energy to escape, okay? So we've brought them up to a high enough temperature where the majority of these can escape, okay? We go from just evaporating to boiling. That's our boiling point, okay? So bubbles cannot form since the vapor pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure. Once your vapor pressure, okay, once you can measure that vapor pressure to be the same as atmospheric pressure, you get boiling, okay? So the boiling point really is not about temperature. It's really about pressure, okay? So again, I'm going to say that one more time. It's kind of an important concept here. The boiling point is not about temperature. It's about pressure, okay? Boiling point is a point at which the Vapor pressure you generate in the liquid, because it's evaporating so fast, matches atmospheric pressure, okay? Or the pressure pushing back down on it, okay? Um, so if you can imagine, if we have a really high atmospheric pressure, a high pressure day, things take more energy to boil, okay? If you move from the beaches in Miami and you try to boil some water on the beach in Miami, you're going to maybe cook up some fish or something, I don't know, okay? You have atmospheric pressure pushing down on you at sea level. That pressure is going to be greater than if you're going to Denver and you're going to um, going to boil up, you know, I don't know, something, something up there in Denver. You're going to boil something, okay? Uh, <clears throat> maybe some noodles. Now, the difference there is the atmospheric pressure in Denver, because it's at high altitude, will be less than the atmospheric pressure, let's say, in Miami. So less atmospheric pressure means the boiling point would be less, okay, because you have less atmospheric pressure pushing back down on it, okay? So you need to look at that idea that boiling point is not just 100 degrees Celsius for, for water. It's not 212 Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit for water. That 100 degrees is, happens to be the point at which, under normal atmospheric pressure, the pressure generated by water matches that of the atmospheric pressure, okay? So we can also say that boiling is a cooling process, okay? If you think about it, it's actually endothermic because as you are boiling something, your highest energy particles are going to leave first, okay? So all your highest particles leave first. And the only reason why you continue to boil something is because you have some sort of burner, a hot plate or a stove that constantly puts energy in, okay? If you start to boil water and you turn the stove off, it stops boiling. Well, it stops boiling because all the highest energy particles leave. They're gone, okay? Which means the remaining particles in there actually have less energy than they originally had because your highest ones have left, okay? Which means you technically are a cooling process, okay? It's also why a steam burn is worse from, from the steam than it is from boiling water because the steam above the boiling water, if you go pound for pound, that steam actually has higher energy than the water below it that might be very similar in temperature. Okay, because your highest energy particles turn to steam first when you talk about this stuff. Now, here's a graph of our boiling points of some different things. Okay, so if we take a look, here is your vapor pressure in torrs or millimeters of mercury. Okay, atmospheric pressure, typical atmospheric pressure in our world is about 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 torr, okay? So on a normal day for us, we're about one atmosphere of pressure or 760 millimeters of mercury, which means on a normal day, an open system, we could actually boil diethyl ether at this temperature, okay, at 34.6 degrees Celsius. Ethanol boils at about 78.3 degrees Celsius, okay? Water boils 
at about 100 degrees Celsius, okay? So the point at which we get water to boil is when the pressure from the inside of the water, the vapor pressure, equals the atmospheric pressure, which would be about 760 millimeters of mercury or torr, okay? Now, if we decrease the pressure, so if we actually bring the pressure down, let's say we only are at a pressure of 400, okay? So we cut, cut it about in half, okay? Um, that's pretty drastic, okay? There's no place in our plant that we can cut the pressure in half uh, in terms of that. If that was the case, come across here, water would boil somewhere between, you know, 80 and 90 degrees Celsius, okay? If we cut the pressure down to about a fourth, it would boil about 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, okay? If we got our pressure down low enough, let's say we got it all the way down here where my cursor is at right now, so we really, really, really cut our pressure down. We actually created almost a, a, good, a really good vacuum. We could get water to boil at room temperature, okay? Now, that's not easy to do, but we can lower the pressure enough to get water to boil at room temperature, okay? And I'm actually going to show you that in class. We actually have a vacuum pump that can do that, and we'll actually be able to take water, and we'll set it up here at 100 degrees Celsius, and we'll, we'll um, not, not 100 degrees Celsius, we'll actually take water, which will be at room temperature right here, and then we'll re decrease the pressure down and down, 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 down to a point where we actually can get water to boil, okay? So we'll actually be able to boil water at room temperature, and I'll prove that to you and show that to you uh, in class sometime here, okay? So keep in mind that boiling point is a, a function of pressure, not temperature, okay? Boiling happens when the vapor pressure from your liquid equals the external pressure pushing on it from our atmosphere, okay? All right, that brings us to gases, and we're going to stop our video here. Thank you.